You know, I'm going to start with hydrogen sulfide and then we're going to branch into foam. So I'll try and get through uh, what I'm going to say on hydrogen sulfide pretty quickly, but I think it's a pretty serious issue. All right, so when we look at uh, manure and why, why it's a bigger problem now, if I look at about 10 years ago, we were averaging somewhere around 3 pounds of sulfur per 1,000 gallons of manure. Well, right now, we're probably closer to 10 to 12. So what's that mean to us? Well, there's a lot more reserve, a lot more potential to have some hydrogen sulfide issues. Um, not going to beat around it. A lot of that has to do with how much DDGs we're incorporating in our, in our ration. Uh, DDGs are bringing sulfur in. The pig can only retain so much sulfur in its body. If we double the amount we're feeding, most of that's going to end up in the manure. Uh, once it's in the manure, it's going to get turned into hydrogen sulfide. The question is just when are we going to release that and are we ventilating enough to get it out of our building safely? Um, one of the things we've seen is there's a high farm to farm variation in hydrogen sulfide. You all probably think, I should be a manure expert and be able to tell you why. No good reason. Uh, I know you're all feeding roughly the same rations. DDGs vary a little. Um, certainly, where we're getting our water from can make a difference. But there's a lot of variation in how much sulfur is still in that manure. So I can't look at a manure and say, oh, we should be cautious of that one. This one looks safe. Uh, since there's no good way to tell, we have to treat every barn like it's going to be that ticking time bomb. They all have that potential. All right, so some of my colleagues, uh, and, and myself included after them, have went out and measured some hydrogen sulfide levels coming out of the barn. Um, most of the time, we won't have an issue. It's only when we're agitating, when we're disturbing that manure, that we're going to off-gas a lot of that hydrogen sulfide. Um, certainly, uh, we've seen some concerns. We used to talk about watch your pigs in the barn, watch for pig loss, right? We knew that there were some bad conditions in the barn. Uh, recently, due to the higher levels, I've started to see some relatively high concentrations coming out of the exhaust fans while we're ventilating, even if you're following best management practices, not disturbing that, uh, the manure surface, making sure that we're doing subsurface ag agitation, that we have two feet of headspace so our pit fans are working. Well, certainly those tips help, but there's still a lot of sulfur reserve in that manure, and it likes to come off in big bursts, so it's not uncommon to see higher levels coming out. Some great pictures of uh, Steve Hoff and, and Jay Harmon out there doing, doing some sampling. They did some smoke testing. Where's this sulfur coming out uh, as, as it's leaving the barn? Sort of where do these plumes move? What does that mean for some of our workers while we're agitating manure? Um, what are we seeing if you're in the pump tractor running that agitator? If we're walking around the barn, what sort of levels are we being exposed to? And they were some surprisingly high levels. Um, in the news not too long ago, we've had four deaths due to hydrogen sulfide related to animal manures. Um, that's far too many, right? We have to be aware of the, of the risk and know what we can do to, to mitigate it. Certainly those barns, it wasn't manure agitation or removal when they occurred. It was routine maintenance in the barn where they went down, disturbed the surface, and lo and behold, something happened. They passed out, were overcome with gases, and the next person went in to rescue them. Uh, that's pretty common. We see someone who's in distress. Our, our natural instinct is to want to help. But in that, those sorts of conditions, uh, it's a danger for both us and them. The mistake wasn't made when the second person went down after them. I mean, I, I think about myself and I like to think, if I was in that situation, I'd probably want to do the same thing. But we just can't. So we have to take that precaution on the front end. We have to make sure we know what the conditions are where we're going, think about what that means for our safety, and what's our escape plan if something would go wrong. All right, so just a little picture of uh, some of the levels we've measured. These aren't in the barn. These are concentrations that were actually leaving the barn while, while the pump out was occurring. Uh, some various ventilation conditions on the bottom, uh, ranging from almost uh, great ventilation, right, curtains completely up, uh, a nice uh, wind that day, to uh, some curtains down, closing the barn a little bit more uh, to see what would happen. And if you look, we can get up to concentrations of 200 parts per million. Does that sound like a big number or not? It's, it's a big number, right? Uh, normally, I think about 500 parts per million is almost instant death. Anytime you start to see 200 parts per million, you could have some health consequences, dizziness, lightheadedness, things of that nature. Uh, so that's a real concern for us, and that's not in the barn, right? That's what's coming out of the barn. If we're at uh, a point where we're agitating, that could be coming out to you when you're in that pump tractor. If we're going to start driving heavy equipment down the road, are, are we in a state of mind? Are we in a condition where that's a safe activity? Those are the sorts of things that we're going to have to, to start asking and answering uh, as we go through this. That's right. That is the top of the meter, so it could have been higher. All right, so what should we do? Well, the first precaution that I would recommend is employee monitoring. It's a cheap uh, insurance policy to sort of let you know where you're at. For $100, you can have a meter that's going to start beeping if you're in a dangerous situation. 
right? So that, that's pretty cost effective. I think if I'm going to do some of these things, that's something that I'd want on my person. Uh, the next thing is barn ventilation. Certainly we know that hydrogen sulfide is going to come off. We have to make sure that we're flushing that out of our barn, getting that air exchange. And finally, we have to be vigilant of, of the environmental conditions around us. Uh, one of the days I was out there doing this monitoring, there was a 60 mile an hour wind. What's my chances of seeing hydrogen sulfide 50 feet away from the barn? I would have told you zero, right? That wind should be so rapid, it's flushing fresh air all around me. Well, between those buildings, I saw a buildup of 50, 100 parts per million of hydrogen sulfide. Relatively high levels, especially for those conditions. All right, just some example gas meters. Uh, I recommend taking, taking a look at some of these. There's lots of options out there. Most of them will stay, there, they'll stay calibrated for about two years. From my perspective, calibration's great. But it, if we're using it as a warning system, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be close. So it's not that it, we hit that two-year window, throw these things away, and start over. Uh, <clears throat> they're probably good for longer than that, as long as we're taking their warnings seriously. Some, some pumping tips. Number one, make sure all your ventilation fans are working. Oftentimes, I'll go to a bar and see a couple fans maybe not really working the way they should be. Maybe they don't turn on at all. Uh, definitely a concern. Make sure your air inlets are open, right? We want to get as much fresh air moving through that barn as we can. And then uh, the big thing is the fan's a fan for a reason, right? We want to exhaust air from there. When we take the cover off to drop our agitator in, well, that's no longer working like an exhaust port. It turns into an inlet. Uh, so one easy tip that we can use is placing a tarp or trying to block that airflow that's going back into the barn so that ventilation system really is working like it should. And then finally, communication is key. Uh, certainly we know there's going to be some p the potential for pig challenges, but no one should ever rent it or a barn. Uh, during pumping. So it's important for that farmer and crew to communicate about what's going on, what activities are occurring. And then think about where your surround what your surroundings are. It's easy when you're, you're pumping to go around, check a pump tractor, walk from tractor to tractor. Well, are you walking right next to those barn fans? Uh, probably not the best idea. Luckily, Steve here was holding his, his uh, meter so he knew exactly what conditions he was in, right? So the take home is hydrogen sulfide's going to be an issue. Uh, as long as we're continuing to use DDGs in our ration, it's going to continue to be a, an issue. I'd like to tell you there's some magical cure where we're going to dump something into our manure and, and get rid of this hydrogen sulfide. I don't see it happening. Right? We can do short-term treatments where we're going to adjust what's there in the manure right now, but they aren't going to have lasting effects, at least not that I've seen. Um, looking to the future, what's that mean? Well, it might mean we have to start rethinking our manure management systems, maybe getting the manure out of the barn so that we don't have these issues when we're agitating. All right, then probably why you all, guys all wanted me to talk, say something about pit foam, right? So this has been uh, a pretty big effort led by uh, Iowa State University and Steve Hoff over there, but uh, we've had great involvement from the University of Illinois, the University of Minnesota, and then hopefully Iowa State's done our, our fair share in, in coming up with some information. It's a really complicated problem. I'd like to tell you that I have great answers. I'm not going to say that, though. I'm going to say we have new knowledge, we've learned a lot, and hopefully I can give you some, some points in the right direction. Number one is check your pits often. The condition of that surface can change quickly. Um, within a week or two, you can go from having a crust on there to feet of foam. If we're going to do some activity, if we're taking pigs out of the barn and we're going to pressure wash, check your pit. Look for foam. If you don't check your pit, assume it's a ticking time bomb and that there's foam on it. Um, I don't have any other good ways to put this. It really is a dangerous situation. It stores enough methane to cause a large fire. Under the right conditions, it can be explosive. That's a danger to both you and your animals and your livelihood. Uh, one accident a year is one too many. All right, so what do we know about foam? This should be familiar if you've heard me talk before. <clears throat> There's really three things that we say we need to get foam. The first one is we need something to fill those bubbles. Just like when you were a kid playing with uh, uh, your bubble, bubbles, the first thing started with your breath, right? Blowing the air into it. Well, in a pit, it's going to start with biogas. Basically, there's no way to shut that off. I have some great laughter in the back over there. All right. Thanks. For you, Laura, it'd be uh, your rubber ducky in the bathtub with your bubble bath, but whatever. All right. Biogas is going to be produced in manures. We know that. Um, there's basically no way to turn it off in a slurry-type system. I will say that recently, with, with our foaming barns, 
it's getting more productive. We'll talk about a few reasons why, uh, but we're seeing it make that gas much more quickly. So that's the first big step. The next one is we need something to surround that bubble. And we'll say surfactants or surface active agents. Um, chances are it's there in the manure naturally. I don't think anything's changed drastically over the last 10 years that caused, hey, this is our new surfactant. And then the most important one is it needs something to stabilize that bubbles. Just like when you were little and blew your bubbles in chocolate milk, it was fun to make them, but they broke down and we still got to enjoy that tasty goodness, right? Well, manure foam doesn't seem to work that way. If that, those bubbles form, they stick around for long periods of time. And for fir at first that was pretty confusing to me, but I, I think I've come up with an analogy that might help us out a little bit. Who in here loves lemon meringue pie? Not that many hands. Come on, everyone loves lemon meringue pie, right? Well. When your, your grandma taught you how to make meringue, she probably said, well, you start with some egg whites, add some sugar. My grandma told me to use a copper bowl. You beat this together, and it turns out that, that the protein in those eggs and those sugar, that carbohydrate, can bond really well together, and they form this nice, gooey, delicious emulsion, right? Well, manure foam is basically the same thing. It's protein mixed with this microbial sugar uh, that forms an emulsion. Probably not quite as delicious. Maybe we don't want it on our pie. Uh, but the chemistry is really similar, which is both a, a good and a bad thing, right? It gives us an analogy to think about, and hopefully it can lead us to some treatments. But that's what makes it really stable, is it's that, that emulsive chemistry. All right, we've taken a lot of manure samples. At uh, one point, we thought maybe the solution was to just sample this problem away, right? If we collected enough manure, there wouldn't be any manure left to foam, problem solved. So uh, we have roughly 2,000 uh, samples behind most of the data that we're going to show you, so lots, lots of things to talk about. Uh, I'm going to zoom through that a little bit. One of the things that I got to do on this project is work with a really good nutritionist. Um, as an ag engineer, I know almost nothing about swine nutrition, but I've had to learn on the fly, and, and he's been really helpful answering all my silly questions that I know nothing about. But uh, what he's put together here is sort of a table of how our diets have changed and what that might mean for our manure. And he's comparing here a, a corn-soybean diet, so what we would have assumed was a standard diet 10 years ago, with uh, corn 35% DDG's diet. And the important thing is, a lot more carbon coming out the rear end of that pig. Probably doesn't come as a surprise, right? We took a highly digestible ingredient, corn, and replaced it with some less digestible DDG, since it's mostly fiber. But if we look at what's actually coming out of the pig, you know, we can talk about proteins, we can talk about fiber, and we can talk about oil. But to me, the big one, big ones here are, are the protein, right? Because we know that's a binder that forms in our, our foam emulsion. So that protein is pretty important to us. Well, overfeeding DDGs without adjusting your ration to bring those protein levels down, a lot more protein in our manure. Well, that's probably not what we want. Now, we could ask questions like, do you think that if we go back to corn soy diets, is there still enough protein to form this emulsion? My answer is yes. I think there's probably almost always enough. But certainly it doesn't help when we put extra of something those microbes really need for this process. The next one is fiber. Pigs aren't very good at digesting fiber, right? That's why we don't feed them alfalfa or grass. Maybe they don't digest it very well. In some way, D ways, DDGs is the same thing. Certainly they'll get some energy out of it, but they're not great at breaking it down. So we end up with more in the manure. And if you're a microbe in that manure, every time you get some more fiber, you go, yum, yum, that's something I can break down, and I'm going to turn it into methane. So we're just feeding them the things they need to sort of make more methane or to form this emulsion from protein. And then fibers are fun for them to break down. Oftentimes, microbes will make a goo to help them digest the fiber. Probably something to do with that microbial emulsion that we're making. All right, so he can give you great details on what that really means for the diet. What it comes down to for me was, what's it mean for biogas production? So if we look on the left there, I have three diets that made more methane, or had the potential to make more methane than the three on the right. The three on the left, we ground coarse, so about 700 microns when we fed it. The three on the right were ground fine. So the good news here is I think as you guys try and do things to make your diets more digestible, to improve your feed conversion efficiency, we're going to start robbing those microbes of some of the things we need. And you're going to say, we already grind fine. Certainly you do. The other factors to look at there are what was the, the in effect of different ingredients, whether that's corn or DDGs or, in, in this case, soy hulls. Well, DDGs had a pretty big effect. If you look at both of those graphs, it made a lot more methane than that corn soy diet, right? So the impact of DDGs, more DDGs in the ration, 35% in this case, looks to be probably as big as the impact of switching from grind size 700 to 350 microns. 
So it's a pretty big an impact for a microbial community when we give them those, those DDG levels, or potentially even higher in real rations. What that led, has led to is microbes are always just moving this carbon much more quickly through their cycle, starting out as rough fiber, breaking it all the way down to methane. And methane's the, the dangerous part, right? It's the one that can cause our explosions when we release it. So that led us to questions of why the heck are they really making more methane? Is it just because we're feeding them more of what they need, or is there other things going on? And as a scientist, I, you know, I said, well, there's lots of factors that can cause it. Let's look at these. Is it just the amount of food that's there, or is it somehow related to the quality of the food? And I'll tell you the truth. None of those theories panned out like I, I thought they would. None of those were drastically different. And you guys will tell me, that, that's no big surprise. This barn foamed, this one didn't. I fed my pigs the exact same ingredients. How could it be related to the feed, right? I would tell you, that looks to be at least partially true. So working with Illinois, they did a lot of microbial data, a lot of extractions, a lot of what type of microbes are there, and then we have to try and think about what this means. So this is a, a pretty nice slide, but essentially what they did is they took a census of that pit and said, which guys are there, and hopefully we can figure out which ones are causing bad things to happen. All right, the important part is there's an art to reading these graphs. So if you look at the bottom center of the screen, you'll see the purple squares and some blue circles. How closely the data point is to a different data point means those microbial populations are really similar. Uh, maybe a good analogy would be if, if Wisconsin and, and uh, Iowa would pot, plot close together on this type of graph because we have similar demographics to our states. Whereas maybe California would plot way on the other side of the graph compared to Iowa, right? Because we're drastically different. So if you're close together, you're pretty similar. If you're far apart, pretty different. So when we look at this for foaming and non-foaming manures, we get two pretty distinct clusters, one for foaming barns and one for non-foaming barns. So we know something from that, right? We know for some reason these microbial communities are pretty drastically different. And based on some of our feeding trials, I would tell you it's probably due, at least in part, to the ration that we're choosing. Now, when we tried to do some ration analysis on uh, these real diets, it was a lot harder because you guys change your diets a lot, right? But hopefully we can use some of our feeding trials to provide a little bit more clarity on that. I think we're making a little progress in trying to understand that. One question I get is, which microbes are these? And this slide is an eye test for you, so I apologize for that. But uh, from my standpoint, I don't know what one specific microbe does versus another. And there's a lot of redundancy in microbes that are in manures. Many of them do almost the same things. Uh, but one of the things that we've seen very consistently is ruminococcus is enriched in foaming manures or alternatively is less prevalent in non-foaming manures. So one of the treatments I think we've talked about before and that you guys have, have probably thought about is an ionophore, whether that be something right, like rumensin or what I would recommend, Skyces or Nerison. Um, they really attack that specific microbe, right? That's what we know from the literature on feeding cattle. So when we're throwing an ionophore into our manure or feeding it through our pig, what we're really trying to do is take on that guy. And that guy is related to the pathway where we turn yummy carbon into methane. So we're trying to block that pathway. So if we think about it as a pyramid where we needed that gas production, we needed that surfactant, we needed the stabilizer, that treatment approach is really trying to take out that gas production phase. Now it doesn't shut it down completely, it just slows it very drastically. All right, we talked a little bit about some diet differences. I think this data gets to be a little noisy, um, but in general, what I see when I look at the graph like this is it looks anytime like we've increased fiber in the diet. It tends to be more foaming populations as compared to if we fed more digestible ingredients like corn. So that would be my general takeaway from that. Now I'll admit this data gets really noisy and the more you dig into it, it's still pretty noisy. But the simplistic approach would be more fiber in the diet, more carbon in the manure, tends to lead towards more of these foaming communities. And it's very much tied to the functionality of what's happening in that manure. If we have that foaming community, they're processing that carbon a lot more quickly, they're making that methane. So it sort of follows through that these properties are tied together. My favorite part to talk about, what stabilizes foam? I've hinted before that it's that protein. So we started to really look at this. And the foam itself is super stable. The manure underneath it, we don't tend to get that foaming property as much. Or if we can make some bubbles, they just won't stick around. So something special about the chemistry of that foam. And I think it's mostly because stuff that's in the manure moves to the surface. We've played with this a lot, tried to understand it. 
you guys can, can tell me this you know, from your experiment, experience. You'd say it's, it's really sticky and it, it flows really poor and it's viscous. Well, we took measurements, right, to quantify it, and lo and behold, it's really viscous. So we started asking questions of why that would be true. And a lot of times I'll say, it's all, viscosity is related to total solids in manure. If we put more solids in it, it's got to be more viscous. And for foam, that, that could be true. There's a lot of solids in it. But they're really, really fine particles, 2 to 25 microns, so really fine. That's not feed particles. That's nothing that you guys are doing to, in your diets to cause it. That's something that microbes within the manure, they're making. Um, so if we end up with more carbon, we have data that says, if you put more carbon in your manure, we end up with more of these particles because the microbes are more active and make this stuff. There's my graph that supports that. I don't want to talk about it too much because it's really tough to see, but the, in, if you had coarse ground feeds, so stuff with more carbon in it, I got more of those fine particles, which was counterintuitive to me because originally I thought it was going to be related to grind size. We stumbled onto this by accident. We said, all right, we're going to try and work on treatments. And one potential treatment that people have said before is tannins. If you put tannins into manure, we shut off methane production. Well, we put tannins in manure, and we took a manure that didn't have foam on it, and we blew some nitrogen gas to it, and lo and behold, tons of foam. So sometimes the best things are mistakes, right? But tannins have a lot of properties that are unique. The biggest one is they bind really, really well to proteins. So we happened to stumble onto this, hey, there's some, some protein involved in our foam. So we played with that a little bit more, and we've proven that there's a lot of protein in that foam. But more importantly, from you guys, for you guys' perspective, there's potentially ways to help degrade or eat up that proteins in manure. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. One is heat treatments, right? If you take a hard, an egg and boil it, hard boil it, the protein at the end looks nothing like it did at the beginning. We've denatured it. So there's potentially ways to denature other than heat. That could be a chemical treatment, things like uh, treating with hydroxides or pH adjustment. Or they sell products called proteases that are really good at breaking down proteins. All right. And the good news for you guys is I'm about at the end of my time. So there's some fun, fun chemistry, and if you want to talk more, I'll be at the Iowa State booth. But we know that more carbon is leading to more potential for biogas. We've also increased protein levels, and that's really leading us to a situation where we can form this meringue-like emulsion. So hopefully by working on the chemistry of that emulsion, we can learn how to tear it apart. I'm going to finish up with three minutes on precautionary measures. Really important. Safety has to come first. We're working on a solution to hopefully help prevent foam. I don't know that we're going to reach a solution that's going to be satisfactory for you all. I think as long as we continue to feed higher fiber ingredients, we're probably going to deal with some of these foaming issues. Uh, certainly there's some things we can do to try and limit it, whether it be proteases, whether it be ionophores. But in all cases, I think we have to focus on what we can do while we're working with the manure to keep ourselves safe. So if we're doing things that are going to disturb the surface, if we're going to break foam, whether that be from sprinkling or power washing our barn, making sure that we have ventilation running. Even when you remove pigs, make sure you maintain minimum ventilation. Um, I have some guidelines, some tips on there for some ventilation for you. Uh, but uh, if we're, we're not going to be using our barn, making sure that we're turning off pilot lights, that we're doing what we can to avoid that spark, that ignition source. So I